I welcome you to the 110th lecture of the Sri Lankan Literary Society in UK. Um, this, is, this is a voluntary organization. It's not even, I would call it even an organization as such. Uh, we are like-minded people who gather twice a month uh, with some interesting programs and share our views. So, this is an open forum. There's no membership as such, and all the meetings are open to everybody. So the minimum I ask you is to share our uh, meeting information with your friends and colleagues, especially if they're interested in the topic which is being discussed. And for the matter of the topics, the only topic which I have uh, banned in that sense is medical related topics because most of us are doctors and from morning till night we talk about medicine so this is our chance to talk or learn about something other than medicine so I don't want any medical topics to be discussed here uh, but anything related uh, or anything entirely outside the arena of medicine is very welcome. Today I heard from somebody that uh, is going to volunteer can you please write down your uh, email in, in the chat so that I can contact you? Thank you very much. Sure. Um, we have a WhatsApp group. Actually, we have two WhatsApp groups. First one is the notification group, and you will only receive the notifications of future meetings and any other uh, last moment notifications such as cancellations, you will receive from that. Whereas there is another group, I uh, call it the Viat Walpal group, and we have lots of political discussions and unrelated things as well. So if you want to uh, make up a friendship group, Viat Walpal group is a very good one for you. Uh, if you just want to know or participate only in notifications, please let us know either Dr. Mahendra Kansal Korala on this email, or you can email me on, on this, so that we, we would add your names into those groups. This is a beginner's guide to Zoom, but I don't want to go through it again, but please make sure you're muted. You know, there should be a red line across. And when we start the proceedings, you can uh, stop sharing your video because then it becomes more stable without the video. Uh, so there should be a line across. Um, and the other thing is there's a green button called share screen button. Please make sure that you do not even touch that button even accidentally because as soon as you do that, your screen will, will be here and it will uh, stop the proceedings. King etiquettes, uh, I don't want to say anything uh, apart from if you have a question, there's a raise hand button, uh, which uh, which is on this bar, and also you can encourage the speaker by using uh, these icons. So the future meetings for your information uh, next week. Usually we have uh, two meetings per month, and this month we have to have uh, two meetings consecutively this week and next week. Next meeting is an evening with uh, Dan Viparana. And uh, because the time is changing from Sunday uh, next week, we, uh, we we will be starting at... Um, am, I, am I right in thinking, Mahendra, that the time is changing next week, right? Yes, it's this weekend we are changing, yes. Yeah, right. So so that means next uh, next week, we are starting at four, uh, sorry, uh, 1400 hours, not 1300 hours. It is 2 p.m. UK time, uh, but the Sri Lankan time, whichever way, it is 6.30 p.m. So uh, for your information, Dan Vitharna is a, a famous photographer as well as a famous musician in Sri Lanka. And uh, I'm very thankful to Lal and Chanta, uh, Dr. Lal Gunasekara, uh, that is, um, who's uh, here today probably, and uh, they have arranged uh, the introduction for Dan Vitarna. And 23rd of April, uh, Masks and Mythology of Sri Lanka by Dr. Premisari Mapalagam. And uh, on 7th of May, it will be country music by Dr. Mahilal Fonseca. 
And this is the advert for next week, which I have circulated on our um, notification group as well as the SLLS group. So today's meeting is with regards to the legacy of Arthur C. Clarke. And I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Tawan Tatungunga. Tawan is one of our members. Uh, I'm very glad that he is, uh, is a member of uh, the SLLF and he's a great friend of mine. In, uh, he has a PhD from Australian National University uh, which he obtained in 1983. His 25-year career in astrophysical research continued at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, the USA, and ended at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Uh, Carvin's career highlights include the first in-situ sample of field halo K giants in galactic halo that it was in 80, 1983. And the first quad gravitational lens discovered with NASA Hubble Space Telescope in 1995. So he has loads of other things to say, but these are the two things which we would like to highlight as a, a, a very highlights. He retired back to Sri Lanka in 2005. Unlike many other people who had a chance to settle down in USA, he decided to come back to Sri Lanka, and now he's there in Mount Lavinia. His current interests include increasing the information on Lanka on the internet via his domain, lakdiva.org, which you can visit and see for yourself what work he's doing. And archaeology with a special interest in numismatics for people who don't know uh, what that means. It's about the coins. He has a huge collection of coins, um, very ancient coins up to the current uh, era, as well as notes. And then uh, this include, including silver coins from the great master's shipwreck that Arthur C. Clarke himself was associated uh, with the discovery. Coming back to what he's going to do today, Sir Arthur C. Clarke is the world famous scientist who made Sri Lanka his home for over 50 of his 90 years. Many persons worldwide inspired deeply by his science and science fiction books knew of Sri Lanka as the far distant exotic land where Clarke lived. He is most famous for the 19, uh, sorry, um, he's most famous for the 1945 uh, suggestion uh, for global communication with geostationary satellites in what is now called Clark Orbit. So that was the first step in the, the satellite phone era. Uh, in uh, the 1968 Stanley Kubrick and Arthur Clark film 2001, Space Odyssey is one of the greatest movies of, of all time. He passed away 15 years ago on 2008, March 19, and will remain in the memory of all who were fortunate enough to know him. His enormous contribution to humanity will clearly be cherished forever. He inspired the careers of many Sri Lankan astronomers. So to listen uh, about Atsri Clark, I hand you over to Dr. Karvan Ratnatunga. Karvan, the forum is yours. Thank you very much. I hope I'm unmuted. Ah, okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, and I'm very happy that SLL has invited me to give this uh, lecture on Arthur Clark on his 15th death anniversary, which is uh, to, uh, today, 15th of no, uh, 19th of March. And I hope uh, to start the proceedings by having a minute silence, because I think in honor of him, he, he did a great service. We'll have a one minute silence.
Thank you very much. And I request everybody to have their video muted to make sure that the reception is better. Okay. So I talked today about Arthur Clark. Okay. On Zoom. Okay, I, Arthur Clark was born in 1917, December 16th in Minehead, Somerset, England, and was the eldest of four children. This is a photograph of Arthur Clark when he was two years old. I thought I, I keep to Arthur Clark's uh, uh, thing or doing magic, and I sort of colorized this with the AI tool caught, uh, and I think it improves the resolution as well as makes black and white images into color, which is quite magic for me. And I think uh, to quote Car Arthur Clarke's third law, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I think that colorization and improving the resolution is one such thing, which I don't understand how it is done, even though I spent my time uh, discussing. Uh, doing uh, image processing with the Hubble. This is a color photograph, a black and white photograph I found. This is when it goes color, and what is more fascinating is when it improves the resolution of the photograph. I have no idea how it is done. It must be like chat GPT, which is now becoming very popular, but I think this is even more complicated. Okay. Arthur Clark, uh, in his early in 1943, was working for the Royal Air Force, and his most uh, famous suggestion was around that time when uh, he suggested the use of geostationary satellites for global communication. He wrote a letter in 1945, February issue of the Wireless World. And this, uh, from after the letter, scientific paper also was published in October of 1945, which is quite famous. And it became a reality just in 20 years. The equatorial orbit, which is 35,000 kilometers from the Earth, has been officially named the Clark Orbit by the International Astronomical Union. Now, this is uh, Arthur Clark reading my copy of the 1945 February Wireless World. In this, he writes an art letter to the editor about the peaceful use of the V2, um, V2, V2 being the rocket that was developed by the Germans for bombing London. But after the war, they were all picked up and brought, taken away to G uh, in USA and Russia, which started a journey into space. This same uh, article, uh, a more serious article over the letter was published in October, and this is the October 45 issue. And he still talks about extraterrestrial relays uh, to give worldwide uh, communication coverage, which is what we are using today to communicate instantly over uh, between us in England and Sri Lanka and anywhere else in the world. This happens when you have a uh, satellite orbiting the Earth and it is over the equator and takes exactly 24 hours to orbit the Earth. Then the satellite would be stationary with respect to the rotation of the Earth and with, uh, appear to us at the same location. So this is the sort of thing you have a satellite uh, at, at some uh, that 35,000 kilometers away and it is stationary with respect to you. We have one on top of uh, the weather satellite, which is on top in the Clark orbit, looking down at the Indian Ocean. And it will. this is the sort of view of the whole globe that it will see from out there. So each of these satellites have a view of most of the globe. And with about three satellites, you can have communication on all directions. So in this figure three of that paper, he showed how you could have three satellites located at a geosynchronous orbit, and that would be able to communicate among itself and communicate with the whole world. 
this is what uh, the current situation with respect to weather satellites are. We have about five weather satellites monitoring the global weather and what you get as weather forecast all come from these satellites. The first geosynchronous satellite was uh, launched in 1964, just 19 years after Arthur wrote that article. And it is, was used to relay uh, the Summer Olympics in 1964 from Tokyo to the US. It was near the international date line. If you take the satellites that are in orbit, there are about 5,000 active satellites now in orbit around the Earth, of which about 500 are in geostationary orbit. This geostationary orbit is the orbit that you see located like here. And that is uh, the orbit that has more than 10% of the satellites uh, that are in current orbit. So it has become the most important of the orbits. Interestingly, if you look at one of these uh, satellites from the ground, you can actually point a telescope at it if you know the coordinates of the satellite. You see them stationary. If you, are, if you don't track with the telescope, you'll see the stars rising and setting, but you would see the three satellites uh, in this picture as geostationary stationary satellites which do not move with the rising and the setting of the stars. So Clark was interested in uh, interplanetary uh, uh, thing from early days. He was, uh, as a teenager in 1934, he was, uh, became a member of the British Interplanetary Society and was chairman from 46 to 47 and 51 to 53. From 41 to 46, he served in the Royal Air Force as a radar specialist involved in early warning radar scenes. And after the war in 1948, he got a first class degree in mathematics and physics from the King's College London. So he has the same physics background that I had. The science fiction stories were published uh, in 1946, and in 46, he got the first story ever sold in 1946 May, published in May, and a few others. I was lucky to buy the copies of these uh, uh, stories. Uh, so he has uh, described all these articles, and I will. Uh, the first article was uh, that he published was in April of 1946. And he had um, an article called Maria in Astounding Science Fiction. Uh, he was not famous at that time. He didn't get the cover. The next article, which he says was the first that he got paid for, was in May 1946. All these are old uh, um, pulp ma magazines called pulp magazines. I will show them if you are like, interested after the lecture. Uh, Guardian Angel was written in April of 1950 and was really became the groundwork of a story that uh, became his book, one of his most famous book called Childhood's End. And uh, that was, I think, in my opinion, his best piece and the one that made him famous, but he was still not on the cover of these pulp magazines. Uh, this is the book Childhood's End uh, by Arthur Clarke, the first edition paperback, not the hardcover. Uh, his first uh, novel, Prelude to Space, uh, 19, was published in 1951, and it gave a plan about how to execute a spaceship, uh, uh, to trip, build and execute a spaceship to the moon. Really sort of giving a description of what a moon travel would be in a more realistic way than Jules Verne, I guess. And that, after that, around that same time in 1951, <laughs> he wrote a more scientific book called The Exploration <clears throat> of Space by Werner von Braun. Uh, and, that, and Werner von Braun uh, used that book, Exploration of Space, to um, uh, convince President John F. Kennedy that it was possible to go to the moon. So that uh, uh, thing was a sort of very interesting uh, uh, thing to know that his book was his 
that his thing was uh, used to. Uh, the next article, next short story that I will talk about is the senator. And that is famous basically because it was the one that led him to write in the book uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Each of these short stories he uh, later on produced to uh, make a longer story. And in this case, it was the origin of the film 2001 A Space Odyssey. Uh, that is by far his most famous book because it became one of Stanley Kubrick's big movies and it still stands out and the American Film Institute claims that this is the 15th uh, film uh, institute, the 15th world, uh, in the top 100 greatest movies, it, they list it as the 15th in 2008. <clears throat> Arthur was very a stickler for, uh, for actually space uh, things and a stickler to make sure that the science in it, all these movies as well as his books was exactly within the framework of science. He, uh, uh, he, paid, um, he was very worried and I can remember him and discussing this with him that the scene of uh, David Bowman going through the vacuum to re-enter the spaceship discovery uh, after Hal, the computer refused to let him in. Uh, he knew that if somebody goes into vacuum that that person's blood would boil. But he got medical opinion that that uh, will happen only after about 15 seconds, 15 to 30 seconds, because there had been experiments done to or do that with uh, various uh, uh, um, dog, uh, animals as well as, uh, I think, I'm not sure, I don't think it was done with humans, and in vacuum, and that was about 15 seconds. This is a view of picture of Arthur C. Clarke in 1968 uh, on the time on the making of the movie. Uh, it was only in 1953 that Arthur Clarke became famous enough to uh, get the covers of the store, uh, his of the pulp magazines, and these are two pulp magazines where he is played in the cover. There are quite a few more. His most famous uh, uh, book is Rendezvous with Ranma, which uh, he published in 1973. It won all the major awards, the Hugo Award the, and the Nebula Award. And this created a big you know, database of fans. And uh, the movie uh, with Morgan Freeman uh, was produced, uh, so was supposed to be produced and released in 2009 has not been so far been released and sadly in development uh, only. Clark's uh, books have been translated to uh, many languages, about 40 languages, as I'm told, by looking at the internet. And um, one of uh, one of Mr. Bandusila, who is in the audience today, translated them, about uh, 10 or 15 of his books into Sinhala. And I'm, I understand they have also been translated to Tamil. So this is one of Bandusila's books in Singhala. Arthur Clarke's, one of his books, which is quite famous, is called uh, uh, Profiles of Paradise, uh, uh, Fountains of Paradise, and set in Sri Lanka. He wrote this book in 1976. And the concept that he has proposed there uh, to go to space uh, using an elevator is being seriously con considered and supported by Sweden breakthroughs in nanotechnology. Talk a bit about that. The basic idea is that you have a very strong cable on the equator stretching up to the Clark orbit. Uh, and this so that you have a counterweight, you had a counterweight beyond the Clark orbit so that the uh, mass, uh, center of mass of the system is on the uh, geosynchronous orbit. And uh, this thing has to have a very strong cable. Uh, this is sort of artist conception of it. You will have uh, about a 13 ton 
uh, elevator which will go with a capacity of about 20 tons to take things into orbit. The operating costs are estimated to be about $250 uh, per kilogram, which is a lot less than the $10,000 per kilogram that it currently costs to put a, 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 a thing into orbit. So this year, if this is becomes reality, and there is a Japanese firm which is saying that they could do this by 2050, I'm not sure whether that will, is a realistic estimate, but people are seriously considering this and trying to do it uh, from, uh, to make it a reality. Um, the climbers will take about eight days to climb up to geosynchronous orbit. And there is a lot of stuff about this and they have had conferences about this uh, many times. And the base will not be in Sri Lanka. I mean, for many reasons. Uh, one is that it has to be exactly on the equator and we are not on the equator. And the other thing is that it needs to be a region which does not have much lightning. And the area that has been selected for it is about 1,500 kilometers from the Galapagos Islands, which according to this chart, as the least amount of uh, uh, lightning strikes. Uh, and a mobile platform will also allow it to avoid some of these lightning strikes. So, so this is, I will quote Clark's second law, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little past them into the impossible. So maybe, I'm not sure whether this, uh, uh, elevator uh, will be possible, but without trying, we'll never know. And that's what he said, uh, the Clark's second law was. Arthur Clark was in 1986, named the Grand Master of Science Fiction, and would clearly be remembered on the way of Jules Verne and H.G. Wells as one of the greatest science fiction writers. Arthur Clark and Ceylon, uh, his uh, association with Ceylon. He arrived in 1954 uh, on his way to Australia to do uh, diving in the Great Barrier Reef. After returning to Ceylon in 1956 February, he wrote to a good friend that he liked the people, the climate, and the cost of living. Maybe now he won't say much about the cost of living. Uh, he wrote, even a year on the Great Barrier Reef did not unlock the doors of memory. Not until I came to Ceylon did I fall in love with an exquisite arc of beach on the island's south coast and decided to establish a home there. This place is Gaul and near Gaul, Unavatna near Gaul on the southern coast of Ceylon. This is a picture of the Unavatna before all the hotels took over and now it's not as nice and clean as what Arthur could remember it as when he went there. Uh, he also wrote the drab chill northern beach on which I had so often shivered through an English summer was merely a pale reflection of an ultimate and long unsuspected beauty. Like the three princes of Serendip, I had found more than I was seeking in Serendip itself. 10,000 kilometers from the place I was born, I had come home. Uh, he says also, and away from the slender palm trees leaning over the white sands, the warm sun sparkling on the waves as they break on the inshore reef. This, the outrigger fishing boats drawn up high on the beach. This alone is real. The rest is but a dream from which I will shall presently wakes. That was what Arthur Clark wrote in 1964 on Sri Lanka. He, one of the th first things he did in 1959, he started the Ceylon Astronomical Association. He was the founding president of it. And during the 60s, he used to travel the world and bring back the latest news with pictures of space exploration, which is shared at our monthly meetings held at the USIS. The Lincoln Auditorium used to have our monthly meetings of the Astronomical Society. That is when I first met him. And he clearly inspired the careers of some of us who became interested in astronomy and space. I can mention at least four or five who were inspired by Arthur Clarke to become astronomers. This is a photograph of him uh, in 1968. 
The previous one was with this Cuesta on the Inuatuna beach. This one, the Cuesta is sitting on the side and he has the first Ceylon's desk computer, which was in 1968 and HP 9100A, which I think was gifted to him by HP. Computer. It's now currently on display at the Arthur C. Clarke Institute. This is him with his 14 inch uh, Celestron telescope. I met him officially uh, in June of 1969 when there was a radio show. We didn't have television at the time. And he took questions from, I was in school and he took questions from us uh, in school at a Radio Ceylon uh, program of which this picture appeared in the newspapers. Apollo 11 was the next month in uh, July of 1969, and Arthur Clark was the CBS commentator what Walter Conkright for all the NASA Apollo missions, and that really put him on the spotlight because those missions were watched by the whole world. Unfortunately, we in Sri Lanka couldn't watch them alive and had to wait till Clark came back with the stories as well as uh, the video which was brought in by the USIS. We have a photograph of Arthur Clark with Neil Armstrong, the first man to walk in space. In the, sorry, walk in the, on the moon. Arthur had a great sense of humor. One interesting story which I can remember was that the Flat Earth Society worried that they would be unable to explain the view of the Earth as a globe published a fantasy story in the TWA magazine saying that the moon landing was staged by a NASA, by NASA with the Arthur Clark writing the screenplay. I can still remember reading this magazine. And uh, Arthur was very amused that he was named as the author. Uh, 20 years later, that same fantasy was made into a conspiracy theory by a famous TV program. So that was in the 90s, and observing the new interest, Arthur said that he had sarcastically written to his good friend Dan Goldin, who was then the NASA administrator, and reminded him that he had never been paid royalties for the Hope Moon Landing screenplay. He told me that NASA never replied his email. Clark was brought to uh, Ceylon uh, for interest in diving. And uh, he, with Mike Wilson, uh, was diving right around Sri Lanka. And this is a book he wrote about the reefs of Taprobane uh, with photographs from Mike Wilson, an underwater adventure around Ceylon. And while he was in this, in 1961, he discovered a treasure of the Great Barsas Reef. Uh, he was also at that time, they were preparing to make a movie, uh, which some of you may have seen. It was called Ranmutudua. Ranmutudua was the first full length single language film which was in color. And it was directed by Mike Wilson and co produced by Arthur Clark. It starred Garmini Fonseca, Joe Abbey and Shivari Kulakuda Surya. And this film, I'm sure many of you have seen had a lot of underwater scenes, which were, they were filming. And while they were preparing for that film, uh, Mike Wilson discovered treasure of the Great Brasses Reef. Arthur was writing about a book about treasure, and then this was discovered. Uh, these were, then the, they didn't recover the treasure till 1963. And these were the coin lumps that were recovered from the Great Bassas Reef in 1963. And I will now go and show you a short video, uh, if I can get this started. Sorry, I, oh, okay.
Oops. I don't seem to be get that video. I will uh, show it at the end of the talk after I go get out of the PowerPoint. So the great bus is, uh, this is reef is off uh, Kirinda or sort of on the side of Yala, which is more famous. And um, it um, is visible. Uh, it's out here. If you, can, if you can see my arrow, it's out here. Off the coast, there is a lighthouse there. And this is a sort of a drawing of the shipwreck that was discovered. We can see various things, an anchor uh, um, on the bottom, various areas where coins were found. And these coins, which were all minted in Surat uh, in India, all of the year 111, 1113 Islamic year age, which term translates to 1702. Uh, and it had this uh, na uh, nature. And uh, you get lots of lumps, uh, most of them in the center of the lump being quite in min state. And this is a complete lump, which is con currently uh, in the Smithsonian, I managed to see it in the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. It's not on display. It was dis on display at an exhibition. Uh, this was the book that Arthur wrote with Ma about the discovery uh, Indian Ocean treasure around that time. In addition to his bigger book. This is a lump of uh, silver rupees, one of the tiny part of uh, one of those lumps. This must, the big lumps had about 1,000 coins. This one must be having about 25 coins and a few other broke a, a coins from the reef, which I managed to acquire. I will show that thing. Arthur went diving again for his last time in 1992 when he was 75 years old. And this is a picture of his last dive. Arthur also starred in a film, Badde Gama, in 1980. It's Leonard Wu's The Village in a Jungle. And it starred him as a minor role as the English judge and had Malini Fonseca, Joe Abbey and Vijay Kumar Tunga, the former husband of uh, Chandrika Kumar Tunga. Uh, he also had a series of TV uh, things called Mr. Uh, Arthur Clarke's Mysterious World, Arthur Clarke's World of Strange Powers, and Arthur Clarke's Mysterious Universe, all made by the Yorkshire Television and uh, showed on TV. Uh, some of these, I think, were shown in Sri Lanka. I was abroad at that time. And there are 52 episodes in all. I'm not sure whether it's available. I have not watched them all. And that is his steel. So if you, you can actually show a whole year worth. Uh, Clark was made uh, the Clark, what he calls the Clark Act, which has allowed him as a distinguished guest to live in Sri Lanka for the full year without paying tax on his foreign income. Uh, till then, till 1976, Arthur used to live six months abroad and six months in Sri Lanka because of the reasons of tax. And this act allowed him to continue to live in Sri Lanka permanently without going abroad. And that was a great, he spent more of his time in Sri Lanka after that uh, permission. In 2005, the government presented with the Lanka Bimania, the pride of Lanka, which is Sri Lanka's highest civilian honor. Uh, he, Arthur Clark was not, uh, not only made his home, Sri Lanka, as Cham, he adopted his lifestyle. For those of us who had an opportunity of meeting him regularly, he was a friend whom you could drop in without any appointment and discuss life, the universe, and everything. That is sort of very nice to the fact that he uh, did not require, I mean, now we, even, we don't even visit relations without calling and finding out uh, if uh, they are in and whether they are willing to we can visit, but those days when we were small, I can remember 
you didn't visit, uh, when you visited, visit uh, relations, you never called ahead because that was considered in Sri, Sri Lankan culture to be an insult, why you wouldn't come if I was not here. So another thing I can remember from that day is uh, something which I've been spending a lot of my mornings these for the last couple of days, which is to see sunrise behind Sri Pada. The first time I saw it was in 1976 from a rooftop from my home in Kulupitiya. And I wanted to photograph it. I didn't have a telephoto, a telephoto lens to fit onto SLR. So I borrowed, I went to Arthur and said, can I borrow his uh, a telephoto lens? He was quite uh, obliging. He gave and uh, lent it to me, that expensive lens. I took it back and tried to, I think two or three times I tried to uh, photograph with it, but each of the times I had this camera with me, the clouds would not oblige and it was cloudy, so I gave up finally. And the last time before leaving Sri Lanka in 78, I said I will go up to the roof just to see and it was the day that it was perfectly clear and I saw a glorious sight and but no camera. I had to wait till 2007 to get my images shown here. Arthur Clark was also went in national dress. I can remember being embarrassed when I was in Western attire. And when he arrived at my wedding in national dress, uh, in a smart national dress, I was really embarrassed to be in Western attire. I remember him commenting about the modern watches on those hands with in full candy and regalia. So I have sort of adopted it. I have never worn suit or tie since 1982, and I'm one was it inspired by Arthur Clark that you don't need to wear suit and tie. This is a picture of him. Uh, he had a lot of pets. One of his uh, the picture of him on his one of his old typewriters, electric typewriter, and his ba baby monkey Silky is on his arm. Here another case when he has a chinua. And it has Shuhava, and he has a, what was the last Pepsi, his last of his canine friends. He has even buried them in his uh, in his uh, graves for them in Twenty Five Barns Place. There are graves for each of his pets. Okay, Clark was also the first chancellor of the International Space University from 1989 to 2004. And 1996, the International Astronomical Union named asteroid number 4923 in his honor. They wanted to give him 2001, but that had been already been assigned to Albert Einstein. So Clark didn't get 2001. Uh, this was a st two stamps that we issued in, by Sri Lanka in 1999 for a conference for 50 years of communication that was held in 1999. And his, he was he appeared on that those two stamps, and this is an autograph for Stekawa. He was given a uh, Knight Bachelor in 2000, March 15th, by former Prince of Wales, who came to uh, uh, Charles, who came to Sri Lanka to give it to him, and now King Charles. This is uh, Clark with his. Uh, T Rex in his garden. And in nine, 2003, scientists of the Aust University of Monash, Australia, named the newly discovered dinosaur species Serentisarsus Arthur C. Clarke. I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. This is his visiting card where he uh, had written his uh, email address. His email address was only known to his close friends, and he never, that was one of the top secrets that he wouldn't let any of us who knew it share it online with anybody. He used to autograph books for his fans. This is a book plate autographed by Arthur Clark, and his rare first editions of Childhood's End have sold for over $4,000. That was a long time ago. It must be a lot more expensive now. And he was once commented that autographs, so he has autographed so many of these rare copies that unautographed copies may be 
more valuable. He had a good sense of humor. In 2000, the, when I was in Carnegie Mellon, they wanted me to interview him for a program called Earthware. And a good world in 2050 will computers help or hinder. That uh, interview is posted on YouTube if you all are interested. I can provide the link. In 2003, HAL 9000 was uh, inducted into the Robot Hall of Fame of the Carnegie Mellon University. And at this function, I can remember he uh, he he's that was the view of Hal New Thousand, and he com he compare comments. Although I've never considered two thousand and one as a strict strict prediction, but as more as a vision, a way things could work. I have long kept track of in, informally of uh, how our vision compares with computer science reality. Some things we got right, even righter than we ever had reason to suspect others well who could have known. So that's what he presented there. At that event, two other robots were inducted into the Hall of Fame. And these are pictures of them. Uh, I was at that function and I took this photograph and I will give this as a task for everybody to predict who those two uh, robots who were uh, even famous. There are two famous robots, not in their costume as they appeared in the film, but uh, they are two famous name recognition robots. Uh, this is a photograph of Clark in 2005 March when I, when after the tsunami of 2004 December, for the first time he traveled down to his place in Hikkadua. I accompanied him down there and interviewed him. And I can just remember, still remember on that trip, him going to Novatuna and seeing it in its destroyed state, refused to even get down from his car. In 2007, December 16th, his 90th birthday was celebrated uh, at his home in Barnes Place. And a few of us who knew him well were there for his 90th birthday. And uh, he was. Uh, uh, given a much grander celebration by, by the foreign ministry, uh, requested by uh, President Mahindra Rajapaksa at the time, and that was held in the Central Bank Auditorium. And they had invited Alexei Leonov, the first man to walk in space, to attend this meeting along with his close friends. Unfortunately, this was to be his last. That's a photograph of Arthur Clark at that event uh, with the huge cake that was there. This is Arthur Clark with Alex Zilianov and Mahindra Rajapaksa. I was able to have an exhibition of my collection of Arthur C. Clark memorabilia at his uh, official birthday party at the Central Bank. His three wishes for his 90th birthday was to see evidence of extraterrestrial life, which we still have not seen, and uh, that we kick the uh, addiction to oil and to see lasting peace established in Sri Lanka. That fortunately happened about two years after his passing. I will end this talk uh, with a few quotations uh, from Arthur Clark on religion, and one of, on Arthur Clarke on religion says, one of the greatest tragedies of mankind is that morality has been hijacked by religion. On religion, he says, the most malevolent and persistent of all mind viruses, we should get rid of it as quick as we can. On Clarke is quoted to have said in a book, Childhood Zen, that the only form of purified Buddhism the most astute of uh, religion still survived. This was a quotation from his book, Childhood's End, which he wrote before he actually, in 1953, before he settled down in Sri Lanka. And in 2005, this was mi misquoted in the Singhala Bauddha, which mentions Buddha Agama. Uh, and he was quick to point out that he was talking about the philosophy, Dhamma, 
and not the faith-based religion practiced by a majority in Lanka. On nationalism, he said it is not easy to see how the more and extreme forms of nationalism can long survive when men have seen the earth as a true perspective, as a single small globe against the stars. There is a hopeful symbolism in the fact that flags do not wave in the vacuum. So we have not come back to it. We are still warring between nations at the moment. On climate change, he said, climate change has now added a sense of urgency. I would like to see us kick the current addiction to oil and adopt clean and renewable energy sources. Our civilization depends on energy, but we can't allow oil and coal to slowly bake our planet. Uh, his view of the future, which he had published many times in his uh, uh, science fiction books and science things, uh, stories featured the extrapolation of technological innovation and scientific breakthroughs. An optimistic view of science empowering mankind's exploration of the solar system and the world's oceans. Imag images an Ethiopian setting with highly developed technology, ecology, and society. I hope it happens because we don't seem to be trending in that direction at the moment. So uh, Clark's first law I will show, he, he said, when a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. When he states that something is impossible, he is very probably wrong. There's been many case, such cases, and so I think he has been right. Arthur Clarke passed away at 1.30 a.m. Sri Lankan time on 2008, March 19th in Colombo. This is him lying in state at his home residence. Father Mervyn Fernando there. He was also a president of the Astronomical Society at one time and a good friend of Arthur C. Clarke's. I remembered when I saw that uh, scene there that it reminded me of the scene of David Bowman in Arthur Clarke's film 2001, in the last scene, one of the last scenes when he says he fumbled for the light switch in the room that was plunged into darkness and within seconds he passed beyond the reach of Bowman, uh, of uh, dreams. Arthur was very uh, uh, completely secular and uh, did not see the need for religion. He had left instructions that absolutely no religious rites of any kind relating to any religion, faith should be associated with my funeral. And no intervention from the government of Sri Lanka or the United Kingdom. It was held on Saturday, um, March 22nd, three days later, General Cemetery Karantha. It was attended by his brother, Fred, and sister Mary, and three nieces. I spoke to the nieces. Unfortunately, some of them had not been to Sri Lanka during his lifetime. And he was there to rest next to Leste Ekanayaka, who died in a motorcycle accident in 1977, July 4th. This is the funeral cottage. And this is his brother, Fred, and sister. So this uh, is the tombstone. Here is uh, Arthur Charles Clark. He never grew up, but he never stopped growing. And uh, I think that is what all of us who are growing old should do, to never grow up. And in honor of him, I sort of wore this T-shirt. It says, no growing up. I wore it last time when I gave a lecture in 16th of December 2017 on its 100th anniversary. And it sort of reminds me of an incident that I remember in the early days of 1970 when I visited him and his mother Nora was visiting him from England. Arthur asked if I had seen his latest toy and went into his office to bring it out. I was left chatting with his mother who said, little things please little minds. Arthur was still her kid, refusing to grow up. Soon after, he returned with a plastic frame enclosing sand which did not mix completely 
and create destinations like on the rock face. I'm sure you have seen that sort of thing now, which is a popular tourist item. Uh, let's say a few more things about Clark, uh, the Arthur C. Clark Center and the Moratua University. From 1979 to 2002, he held the post of Chancellor of the new University of Moratua from his in inception to uh, 2002. In 1982, he won the Marconi International Fellowship Award and he used the money of that award to build the Arthur C. Clarke Institute for Modern Technologies in Moratua. He unfortunately dissociated with himself with that institution after about 10 years because it was not going in the direction that he wished it to see. I can remember him asking me in 1994 whether I was interested in becoming the director and I said no because I was doing research with the Hubble at the time. Uh, he, all his manuscripts have been taken to uh, England and it was in a, the, what he calls the Clark Archives uh, in Totten, Somerset, England. And after Fred passed away, all the Clark papers were donated to the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum in Washington and can be viewed there. Uh, Arthur C. Clark Foundation was started in 1983 to the to further wisdom and values of Sir Arthur Clarke. And the foundation's mission is to promote and enable the, and recognize the power of imagination to benefit humanity. You can see details of it at clarkfoundation.org. There is the Arthur C. Clarke Trust, which was founded in 2001 to support and sustain Clarke's passion for diving through his two companies, underwater safaris and scuba safaris. The dive shop that he set up back in the 1960s still continues to operate from Trincomalee. His last will designated this private trust that is registered in Sri Lanka as the sole legal custodian of his literary estate. And that uh, trust has a website called arthurclark.org. Arthurclark.org. Many persons worldwide were influenced deeply by his books and writings. Most had never met him since he lived in a far distant exotic land called Sri Lanka. He was by far the most famous foreigner that made Sri Lanka known to the world. Sir Arthur C. Clarke made Sri Lanka his home for 50 of his 90 years. I, privile I feel privileged that I met him regularly over 40 of those years. Arthur will remain etched in the memory of the, all those who need for unfortunate to know him personally through his books. His enormous contributions to humanity will clearly be cherished forever. That's a photograph of Arthur Clark when he was 90. This is a picture of Arthur Clark uh, on at his desk in before he passed away in 19, 2007, so, shortly before. And this is a photograph of the same desk I, when I visited Arthur Clark's home in two th last year in December. And I was very happy to see it practically in the same state. His crystal also still there and it's briefcased on the table. I think this is an ideal location to create a small museum for his work. So, Sir Arthur Clark uh, was born and died in Colombo. Thank you. That is my lecture. I think I took about an hour and I'd be very happy to answer questions about them. Thank you. Over to you, Ruan. Thank you very much, Carmen. Uh, if you go off the screen now, we can... Yeah, I will stop share. Yeah, thank you. Standard way. Right, that was a marvelous uh, summary of Arthur C. Clarke and his works. Thank you very much, Carmen, for that. So this is the time for all the questions. Uh, do I see any hands? Don't see anything yet. 
There's some in the chat box. I'm not sure whether they are questions or. Oh, the, I think there was an answer to your question um, about the robots. That's coming from Johan. Was it C3PO and R2D2? Actually, it's uh, R2D2 and Darth Vader. Darth Vader. Oh, okay. I see. Right. Thank you. So, I was also not sure. In fact, when I originally did that photograph up, I thought it was C3PO, but then I verified that it was actually Darth Vader. But I think that C3PO was also there at that event because I got his autograph as well. Right. Ari. Uh, Dr. Rowan, can I take one minute? Uh, uh, have okay, yeah, that's fine. It's, uh, was it picture? Yes. Go on. Yeah. Uh, show uh, your first face. Of First of all, I also have to thank uh, Dr. Kavan for giving us a very uh, comprehensive lecture with a lot of information about Professor, Dr. Uh, Professor Arthur C. Clark. And uh, unfortunately, in my area, there was two power, power failures. Uh, therefore, one thing is I want to ask uh, Dr. Juan, uh, uh, if possible, let us know the link for the recorded uh, program, if possible. Uh, I, I don't know whether Dr. Carvin uh, mentioned in his lecture about thermal power uh, research, uh, which was done by Dr. Arthur C. Clark in Trikuma area. Did you? Uh, I, I, only, I only mentioned quite a tiny bit of what he has done. I think I, if I was to write about all his things, it would take a couple of hours. Okay. <laughs> so please tell us a bit more about Kitsuri. Oh, right, right, yes, for uh, a start, can you just uh, put on your video for us yes, to yes. see who you are? Ah, uh, yeah. This is me. Oh, there you go. Right. Uh, former former uh, director of meteorology. Now I am retired. Sorry. Okay, then, uh, Doctor uh, Ruarwan. I think we will we will get a chance to uh, see the record. Uh, Yes. This program. yes. So we have right. a YouTube channel. If you just uh, go to the YouTube and uh, search on the Sri Lankan Literary Society, all right. the previous recordings are there. But give me a couple of days uh, until I edit today's program and publish it. It will okay. be published tomorrow or day after tomorrow. Right. right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Now I can see Ari has put up his hands. Ari, you can yeah pose your question now. Thank you. Thank you, Ruan, and thank you, Kawan, uh, for your excellent lecture. Sorry I missed the first 10 minutes or so because I was uh, away. I couldn't get home in time. Um, the I got two questions. Um, one is, uh, what really attracted um sir clark to spend such a lengthy time in sri lanka uh, that is my first question uh, and the second question is um i think there was a negative campaign against him uh, uh, you can correct me if i'm wrong um, but i read a few negative things about him particularly towards the latter part of his life. Uh, can you um, amplify any information on that if you do have? I think with respect to the first, I think you must have missed the first part where I sort of described how his interest in diving is what actually brought him to Sri Lanka. And that was his main aim and that's what he started a dive company here and he settled in. I gave a few quotes by him and I, you could probably see that first part in the video uh, when it is posted. Uh, the second question, uh, I think all of that was unfounded and a little bit of truth about it. I would uh, ask you to read uh, the, his dedication in the book, uh, Fountains of Paradise, where he sort of, uh, you might interpret what that is. I think that is the only official interpretation of what was then distorted in the latter years when he was just about to get his knighthood and got it delayed. And he sort of uh, 
Charles uh, postponed his trip to Sri Lanka and came, I think, in about two years after he was awarded the knighthood. Uh, would it be would it be right for me to assume that the the campaigners were not local? They came. They all came from outside, uh, perhaps uh, from UK, who were jealous. I, 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 I really do don't know who they was campaigning for it. It was a media. I think it was mostly the media for which any sort of uh, story which is sort of puts uh, puts down a famous person uh, is always a sort of interesting uh, for the media to publish on. And I'm not sure really the politics behind it. I was not. Uh, I was not in Sri Lanka at the time, so I can't really comment very much about. It. Thank you very much, Kawan. Hope your gossiping mind is satisfied, Sati. Yeah, but it's, it's more than gossip because it is very seldom that we as Sri Lankans looked down at uh, people from uh, overseas and abroad who come to serve our country. And I, I, was, I was basically interested in finding out who... I initiated the i think it must have been the foreign media who are always interested in a juicy story thank you okay let's go to mahendra um hello Carvin. thank you for the most comprehensive talk i have ever heard on arthur c clark i learned a lot today and thanks very much to you and to be quite honest i didn't know uh, that you were so closely associated with him you're a lucky man i feel jealous <laughs> Now, my question is about uh, his attitude to religion, which interested me. Uh, did he, was he dismissive of religion or did he consider it irre irrelevant or did he consider it positively dangerous? I think he, that I quoted him as what he has said there. He definitely admired Buddhism in, a philosoph in the philosophy of Buddhism rather than the religion Buddhism, which is currently practiced in Sri Lanka. And that's what he quoted even in childhood, which I quoted just even before he came to Sri Lanka. So I think uh, he was, and he felt that religion, he was a scientist. He was like, uh, me, like me, a sort of a person with no religion. And uh, I think uh, he found that religion was a, uh, sort of uh, non-scientific non thing that we should give up in our scientific age. What did he, what did he mean but when he said that morality was hijacked by religion? No, the religion, he, because a lot of people say that uh, you won't, if, if not for religion, the people will not be moral. The people will be killing each other if not for religion. And I think myself that that's a misnomer. You can have an educated public who will know the social norms. And that is what Buddhism brings. The philosophy of Buddhism gives that moral uh, thing without having any religion associated with it. Personally, for me, Buddhism is not a religion, but a philosophy. And, you know, like Confucianism or whatever, they are not, they, you don't need a religion. A religion is something where it's faith-based, where you are believing something purely on faith without any understanding. And that is what he was against. Philosophy, like Dharma, is not was not an issue for him. Yeah. Sorry. Priyat has put up a question, but if he is around, I would like to see who Priyat is. You want Jaika. to come in? Jaika has put his, uh, her, his hand up. Uh, right, let, let, let's wait for Priyat because he's published the question in the chat box. So is Priyat around still or not? Why won't you read it? Why won't you read it? Yeah, I'll read it for you. Thank you, Carvan, um, for the brilliant presentation and a hypothetical question. What would have been Arthur's reaction to the latest telescope, uh, JWT? and amazing discoveries we experience in today's world. Arthur would have been thrilled with the JWST because we are on the fringe of maybe 
discovering whether we can discover signs of life in other planets around uh, in other solar system uh, solar systems from the earth i mean that would be the first indication we have listened with radio telescopes we have not got any signals but the first evidence of possible life may come from the signatures of the atmospheres of other planets if we see oxygen for example in the atmosphere uh, a large presence of oxygen in the atmospheres of other planets that for example might indicate that there is plants there creating the oxygen uh, in those planets so that is sort of research is being made possible by the jwst it was not possible with the hubble and i think it's an exciting time that we are currently living in when possibly those initial guesses we know that there is a planet around a closest star proxima centauri and that is being studied because that is one of our closest stars and hopefully we might find presence of life or we might not and we that is a uh, either way would be very interesting okay let's go to another science fiction buff dr jaika vithana jaika please um show yourself and ask a question hello kavan that Hi, was a jaika. fantastic uh, uh, lecture i learned quite a lot about rc clark uh, besides that some questions rose in my mind which has been sort of lingering on for quite some time too uh now you did mention uh, R. C. Clarke's uh, second law. Uh, I found quite a lot of resonance about that one. Uh, my personal feeling is that uh, even when it comes to science, you can't progress if you're uh, somebody who's a very restricted uh, sort of an atheistic uh, person who always asks for evidence before you try anything out. You can't progress any further. You have at that early stage of uh, uh you know hypothesis hypothesizing for something new you had to have a plausible sort of a scientific but imaginative thought to to progress otherwise you will never try anything uh, new is that right yes i would give an example i can sp remember speaking to uh, the president of sun microsystems when he visited carnegie mellon he said in the 1960s grants were awarded uh, assuming that 3% of the awardees will come up with a successful project he said that now grants are awarded with only with a 30% requiring a 30% probability mm -hmm. of success and therefore no project which is now being funded which had which had not been really tested out and what he said was that the break major breakthroughs in science came around in the 1960s because there was enough money to fu fund even the mad mad ideas and that is what is needed if we want to get scientific breakthroughs if you want to only get progress in science which is what we have seen for the last 50 years then pro uh, funding at 30% success rate is sufficient but he said that you know in the 60s it was funded at 3% success rate because one, one that 3% brought in breakthroughs which maybe we are still exp uh, expanding nowadays but i don't think we have had breakthroughs and that is why in the 1970 i can remember there was claims that we would have fusion energy in 30 years mm. and now 50 years and they are still saying we will have fusion energy in 30 years i mean that is we expected to we expected to go beyond the moon to mars in 30 years we did nothing for 50 years we didn't go back to the moon and that is because funding is sort of politically motivated and not being given in a way that it would advance science unfortunately there is a lot of funding given to the military industrial complex which feels that it should declare war once in 10 years to get test their equipment and if that same funding of the military industrial complex went into funding science instead we would have had uh, scientific breakthroughs which were more less destructive than military breakthroughs but the politics is not happening that way yeah. 
the other uh, point that came to mind was uh, that uh, space escalator you know the making yeah. of cables strong enough to hold this uh, escalator up into uh, the clark's orbit uh, has has anybody sort of developed those those cables or those wires of some sort these they are all nanotechnology carbon fiber sort of technology and there is a group in japan Mm. which sort of formally form, form has been formed and sort of has a website which they we should be able to do this by 2050 i think that's optimistic but without giving a deadline like that nothing will happen because everybody will say okay no point even thinking about it i think that japan has a group which is actually actively working on it because they have re regular conferences on this topic maybe once in five or ten years and I think uh, if they do approach it, not like we have to wait for another 10 years or 20 years before even trying to do it, I think it will take a much longer than us being actively engaged in it. And I hope that it will happen because it will enable space flight because you can't afford to, if you take $10,000 to put a kilogram into orbit, Right, it's far too expensive, and if you can do it for two hundred and fifty dollars, it becomes much more practical to travel into space. Yeah, yeah. Just a final observation. This was about uh, Arthur C. Clarke's funeral, and that the photograph you showed of uh, Martin Bowman, you know, reaching out with his hand up like that. Uh, there's a theory that uh, Martin Bowman actually died because uh, when he was getting old. When he was lying in his bed uh, that one day a monolith came along and gave him a bill for all his private health care and the shock made him uh, die. So That's a nice thought. conspiracy theory. Yeah. Thank you, Carver. That was brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jaika. Okay. Uh, I'll come to Hagga in a minute. Uh, we have another person whose uh, hands up already, Dr. Diamond. You can put on your video and ask your question, please. Thank you. Uh, you are muted. You are muted. Can you unmute, please? If you press the mute button, Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, this is the first time that I got into this uh, seminar, and uh, it was the invitation was sent by one of my friends uh, from Australia. Uh, I'm living in Japan uh, uh, for the last forty-one years. Uh, really, I studied. Uh, in Sri Lanka in Moroto University uh, at that time the University of Sri Lanka cut about the campus and I passed out in 1977 and after that I I was working at the Sri Lanka satellite station at Paduka if you can remember uh, the Paduka satellite station and uh, I was the station manager there uh, from 1980 uh, in fact, uh, at that time, uh, Dr. Clark came to Paduk uh, often, and uh, we were uh, we were uh, I mean we were uh, given all the messages uh, by him to transmit uh, freely from the satellite station at that time, and uh, I was uh, very glad to invite him for my wedding also uh, in 1982 march 6th uh, uh, unfortunately he he sent a uh, letter i have the letter <laughs> uh, uh, written by him his uh, handwriting and uh, in fact he 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 mentioned that uh, uh, dear mr jaman thank you for your invitation but i am afraid I am so heavily committed, it's quite impossible to attend. Uh, attend its weeks since I have been able to uh, leave Colombo. I have not been, I have 
being able to leave Colombo. Also, uh, this is also about religion. Also, I should add that I refuse to attend any activities of a religious nature. Uh, I wish you and your wife the best and uh, luck and includes a small contribution. I would also like to congratulate you and the excellent work you and your staff doing at Paduk Satellite Station. And all the best wishes to you, Arthur C. Clark. He has signed. <laughs> and uh, this letter, I keep it, I mean, as a uh, uh, memory. <laughs> and in fact, uh, I did my uh, master's as well as the PhD in Japan. Uh, in satellite communication. So he is the father of my <laughs> education. And uh, in fact, I, uh, after that, I, I started working in uh, uh, Japan, Japan Telecom and I was, I was at the satellite air stations as well. And I, I retired in 2014. And uh, now I am, uh, uh, I'm retired, I'm in retired life. Thank and, you for uh, this comment. I, I, yeah, want, thank I, want, you. I went recently to the Paduka station. Uh, to give a, there is a, conf, there is a uh, university that has been set up next to it. And That's I, right. And there was, because there was a group there which wanted, has created a small radio telescope. But I see. Fortunately, they, they have not given access to the big dish. And I couldn't understand why not. Uh, they were the Sri Lankan Telecom has mothballed the big dish and did not allow this group to use it like a radio telescope. And I would think that you could both preserve it as well as use it as a radio telescope. And I hope that Sri Lankan Telecom, if you have any contacts there who would persuade them to actually give the students their the access to change the use it, I would think it would be a very good. Uh, thing to use as a radio telescope. Can it be used uh, as a telescope? I mean, it's uh, a it to meter antenna, parabola yeah. antenna. Yeah, I, would, I think it can be modified, and that's what those kids wanted to do. They have taken one of the smaller dishes and made a radio telescope out of it. And if it can be done with the big dish, I think that would be a great thing to happen. I don't know whether it's possible, but not allowing the kids to try, I thought was. Uh, not really correct. Anyway, uh, we'll discuss this offline. Thank you. I see. Okay, right. Thank you. And also, I think, uh, uh, Carmen, I think uh, I, uh, I have some uh, predictions that he, he, he gave in August 1999, some predictions like, you know, uh, NASA RoboMars survey carrying land and rover is launched. Uh, 2004, the first public admitted human clone, the first uh, sample launched back to Earth by Ma Mars surveyor, the Dalai Lama returns to Tibet, mm. uh, the Very first nice. coal, coal mine closed in India, NASA Next Generation Space Telescope uh, successor to the Hubble launched. Uh, yeah, this is uh, this is the prediction that he was done no, uh, but, but August 1999. It was no, in no, the no, daily no, newspaper, huh? it was in the but, daily newspaper in 2000. No, no, what year did he predict the uh, uh, gen next generation JWST to be launched? Uh, 2007. <laughs> ah, okay, for 20, 15 years before it happened. Yeah, right. Uh, and also, I think these were published every year. That he had a set of predictions he sent around every year and was published in the newspapers. Thank ah, you. I see. I see. I see. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also another one: uh, a city in North Korea is devastated by the accidents, <laughs> uh, explosion of an atomic bomb. <laughs> He has also predicted that <laughs> it might happen now, not in North Korea. 
Okay, <laughs> thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, there seems to be another question from uh, Haja Maruf. Haja, you can unmute yourself. Uh, Dr. Ravan, uh, that was an excellent uh, presentation of uh, Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, he was a great scientist of the science of astronomy and uh, whatever uh, the space uh, travel and everything. But I definitely disagree with his uh, consistent uh, denial of religion. Uh, I believe that we have uh, 50 trillion cells in our bodies which were only about 600 billion cells when they were 12 weeks old in the mother's womb. And each one of them producing 1.4 volts of electricity. So we are a big, massive construction that has been done by somebody. <laughs> so, and second thing is, this is a, I know this is a forum of scientists. Science uh, has to uh, shall understand. We, shall we keep to science, please? Shall we keep to science here? I think it's not appropriate for, for you to preach. I, no, no, I'm not, I'm not preaching. I'm just keeping to science only. Basically, uh, uh, I think we have to have an open mind to the life sciences, which is uh, uh, only tree lives about 2,000 years. And we benefit from the trees that they uh, produce oxygen in the daytime. There are many, many harmonial things that are going on which we need to think about. And that's the only thing I do not agree with uh, Arthur Clark. Otherwise, it was a very good lecture. I want, I, very I good just, time. Reply, okay. I must make a comment. There is, uh, from my understanding, there is about a trillion cells and there is about 10 trillion bacteria around your body. No, no, no. 100 but, trillion bacteria inside our gut. Yes, I agree. I know. Uh, these, are science, these are science that have been proven. Yeah. Proven. I can talk uh, for, for another hour on that. You can, you can invite okay. SLNS can invite you to give a talk on this subject to the. We can talk about life care if necessary, yeah. and uh, what is life, and uh, what is mind, and what is brain. There is there is a lot of things that uh, we, we need to understand about our own selves. My only comment is that we do it, need to do it within the scientific framework. We are going on. That into anything else? No, no, no. I didn't. I didn't go out of that. But I, I said the the uh, one of the thing was that anything religious is not mine. It's not science. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you very much, um, Aja. If you if you have a proposal that you want to talk um, to us, just put on your contact details on the chat because we have a forum. We are quite. I have a letter on the chat to uh, to you, Rohan. Yeah, uh, just just put your contact on the chat, right? I have done that already. Yeah, thank you, thank you. We will come back to you. Um, you. We have a monkey story from Shereen Amendra. Shereen, do you want to just uh, show yourself and share that with Carvin? Shereen? Shereen? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I didn't mean to. No, no, know. that's fine. No problem. Just share your story. Uh, because I just uh, wanted to say that I was a one-time neighbor. And, uh, you know, his monkey, uh, Dr. Clark's monkey used to come over and sit on the wall and uh, someone comes looking for him. So I used to always call and say, uh, you know, your pet is here. He, he didn't answer the phone, though. Uh, at one time, I did call and inquire about some bolids I saw in in um, a meteorites really in Polenarwa and he dismissed <laughs> the, uh, the idea. I was just, uh, you know, inquiring, but I was too timid to make any kind of contact. But I was so happy that when I had my MSc, I, I, he was Chancellor of University of Moratua and I was only one qualifying at that time. And he said, oh, you have no competition <laughs> while giving the certificate. It's just a human story, <laughs> that's all. Thank you for sharing that monkey uh, business, thank sharing. Thank you, Carvin, for this wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you, Sharin. Anybody else with uh, questions? Uh, oh, Sarah, 
Yes, Sarat, you have some anecdotes. Yes, I forgot to mention. <laughs> Thank you very much for that excellent uh, talk. It's a long time since I met uh, Arthur C. Clark. I was a founder member of the Ceylon Astronomical Society. And that's the oh, yeah. journal that we published that time. Yes, I got one of the rare copies. <laughs> I gave another copy to Chandra Vikramasinghe. Okay. There is a second volume, which I also have. Yeah, this is volume one, number two. I, I think Chandra Vikramasinghe gave a lecture. I can remember that. Volume one, number one, I think. I got that also. Yeah, it's so long ago, but I left Sri Lanka after that. So that's about all I can say. I met him at the meetings. That, Thank you very much for an excellent lecture. Glad to have met a founder member. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. And uh, we got Dr. Prasanna Nakure, who has a question. Prasanna, stage is yours. Okay. Thanks. Um, thanks, uh, Rwanda. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, uh, Kavan, very yes. interesting. Yes, lecture. we can hear you. Continue. Yeah, thanks. Uh, something that intrigued me, uh, if I may say, I will, uh, 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 Dr. Arthur C. Clark, one may say that, you know, he may not fall into these uh, conventional academic, uh, academic uh, community in terms of, you know, his affiliations uh, to a university or, you know, he was not a, a professor uh, in a university or something like that. But you see, I mean, he had, he had contributed immensely and perhaps, you know, uh, more than many, many other, you know, conventional academics could do, if I, if I have to uh, say so. So, I mean, um, how would you, you, you know, correlate this? I mean, see a man who was, you know, very independent, who was, you know, kind of, you know, island unto himself, uh, who was very independent, uh, comes out, you know, uh, with uh, such fabulous uh, ideas. Uh, yeah, how can you uh, correlate this? One of, the th one of the things that I know that he funded, which was clearly something which was not uh, within the scientific framework, was coal fusion. For some reason, he got very fascinated with coal fusion. And I think he put his money behind that, thinking that was one of the mad ideas which will turn out to be re real. Unfortunately, it has not turned out to be real. And I think he lost a lot of money in that exercise. But uh, I think he wanted to that is the reason you need to try some of these mad ideas not that coal fusion was you can't dismiss all the things that look very speculative uh, from this because you will not have a breakthrough and i think you do need to look at things which beyond that and i have a feeling that uh, clark was uh, interested in uh, putting his uh, money behind certain projects and one of the things was coal fusion and I think uh, even though academia was saying that it was not real, he did fund that for a while I think. Uh, we have to fund the, we, we, have to, we have to have people like Clark who don't look at everything strictly according to whether it can definitely happen. And that is what current, uh, most of the current uh, public uh, funding, if you take NASA funding or whatever, you have to almost say that I can do this before they will give you funding to do it. And that is really, as I said before, in the answer to JICA, it's not the correct way to get breakthroughs. You do have to go beyond the possible and try out few of the mad ideas into the impossible. Unfortunately, there are too many people who are currently exploiting, sort of making up things without, you know, a real justification and exploiting that situation. So the grant funders have been more conservative 
because they can't they have a limited amount of funding now and they have to give it to ones that they feel they will have results with and they can't afford to give it to the ones which are just speculative but clearly to get breakthroughs in science you have to go into the speculative mode and now luckily there are private companies which are willing to fund some of these more speculative ideas because they know that the what the return they would get is enormous if any of those turn out to be real i hope that answered your question yes uh Harvan. yeah that's uh, information to me thank you very much are there any other questions i was just trying to put up uh, information about our youtube channel um, but I can't uh, do it at this stage because I'm um, recording this. So anyone can. Can I ask a question? Has anybody been to Minehead uh, and seen his, his uh, Clark Hives in the audience? Minehead in UK. UK, Somerset, yeah. Okay. That's his original house, Trenton, Trenton and Minehead. I don't know whether they're neighboring places. That's where Fred lived. And all his archives have been sent out there. I'm coming to England in May. I'm hoping to go and visit there. So hopefully I uh, will see it. But I want to know whether anybody in the audience has been there and would give some guidance of the current situation there. Because I'm not sure what the situation after Fred passed away in 2014. I think Sam is asking, is it Minehead or Maidenhead? Maidenhead, Maidenhead. Maidenhead, yes. Maidenhead. 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 Yes, in Wales. So it looks like a Melinda Ekanaika. Actually, it's, it's Minehead, not Maidenhead. Maidenhead is in Kent. Minehead? It is Minehead, yeah. Melinda, uh, Melinda. Melinda Ekanaika has uh, published a comment. It looks like uh, you are right, Carmen. She was the, uh, was the niece, right? Hector's daughter. Hector's daughter. Melinda, Melinda will you, you want to you want to open up and say something? Yes. Sorry, just one second. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How are you doing? It's a bit low. You're not getting through. Sorry, Melinda, we can't uh, hear you very well. Interesting to actually listen to you telling me about um, Uncle Arthur's mom. He used to say it all the time, you know, at home. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes we can hear you now. No, can you? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Now. Thank you. Yeah. We can hear you. Yes. No, I didn't know about mom. Uh, talking about simple things, pretty simple minds, because I never met Uncle Arthur's mom, obviously. But uh, he used to say it all the time about us. You know, whenever we used to watch um, movies in his house or in his room. And, um, you know, he, he'd be like, I'm like, nothing, ah, simple things. I don't know about how it came about. <laughs> he's he's the same. Uh, Linda, are you, are you in Sri Lanka? No, I'm in Melbourne right now. Oh, okay. So it's Quite. about two o'clock in the morning here. <laughs> Thank you, Worship. <laughs> I have a six month old, so that's why I had to come to the other room. <laughs> oh. Thank you so much for joining us. Do you know the answer no. to the question uh, Carmen asked, the, the, the memorabilia, is it in Minehead or Maidenhead? Where about in UK? Do you know that? I actually don't know as well. I can't remember either. Okay. I, mean, I, okay. I, I think it's Minehead as well. Like, mm -hmm. I, I remember when Minehead is the is a is the the word the area i think it is that's what rohana said 100 percent sure it's minehead not maidenhead maidenhead is in kent okay 
No, yeah, no, it should be mine head. Is in yeah. Somerset. My net is in Somerset. Yeah. Yeah, then, then it'll be in Somerset. Yes, it'll be in Somerset. Thank you. Yeah. For staying up late. All right. Well, Thank welcome. You. Take care. See you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Are there any more questions? If not, let's wind this session out. Uh, this is the time when I would invite all of you to put on your video cameras and uh, unmute yourself so that we could thank Carwin. Carwin, it was a treat as usual. You, know, you have done previous uh, sessions for the Sri Lankan Literary Society, but this this one is much more much more interesting to me because of your personal involvement with the subject you are talking about. Arthur C. Clark, and thank you very much. And let us all thank Carvin in our usual manner. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for organizing this meeting. I think uh, it was the uh, first time I'm attending your 100th meeting. So I, I'm 199 meetings <laughs> later, I have attended. And it is good. Uh, we also have a monthly meeting of all my batchmates. We call it Slimo. Nara the Vijayatilago is here, participates in that. Uh, we call it Sri Lanka International Medical Organization. We talk about life sciences and uh, current uh, situation on the life sciences side of it. The community, the, the, the lower part of uh, our lives and not the, the higher up uh, environmental uh, uh, universe that we are talking about at this moment. Thank, Thank you very you. much. We'll be in touch with you. That's fun to <laughs> Okay. Bandusila, would you like to tell a few words? Bandusila, would you like to tell a few words? He's the one who translated Arthur's books in Sinhala. Oh, yes. Jaika was interested in those books. Yeah. Bandusila, would you? Hi. Uh, Bandusila, you have yeah. to unmute yourself. We can see you, but we can't hear you. But I think his mic message not be working. Is it not? I didn't hear this. No, no, I think no, his mic is not working. Probably. So, um, okay. Is it working now? Ah, yes, yeah. yes. That's yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Now. Yeah. No, my association with him was very limited. Only to, uh, you know, present him a book whenever I publish one of those. But uh, he was very, very, uh, I mean, I was unknown character. <laughs> But still, he was very uh, cooperative and he was very helpful. And uh, whenever you ask a question, he went in the length into explaining it. Uh, the, the, so uh, it was a pleasant uh, association, a pleasant uh, uh, meeting. The meeting. Uh, but he couldn't read the, the, the single books I wrote. <laughs> I mean, obviously. How many books did you translate? Uh, altogether now about uh, 16. 16? 16. 16. Uh, Wonderful. So everybody have a nice evening, night or morning, wherever you are from. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, everyone.